Sometimes with people that I, I know and like kind of know, it's actually harder to figure out where to start these conversations. But I was doing a little homework on you yeah. this morning before we talked, and I found an interview that was posted on the Row 2 website. And there was a comment that you made in there about your work having like in subject matter has a very like western feel a lot of it in terms of the landscape and then the references to cowboy culture ranch life that sort of thing and you made a comment that that you felt like you were from that but not of that right and um i just had a a talk that I did with Raul Rene Gonzalez, where I actually almost said the exact same thing, except that I said that, that I am of that, you know, <laughs> and uh, that rural Texas thing is like, so part of me, even though I don't feel like I necessarily always fit into that world, I still feel like it is my world and lay claim to it. Um, probably probably more so these days when when there's like this cultural tension in the air and uh and sort of like you know adversity that's going on um like i i don't i don't want that to be taken from me you know like it's mine as much as it is anyone else's and so i thought that um Maybe we could just kind of start there with like that comment that you made. And I know that was, I think it was a couple of years ago when you said that and you probably, you may not even remember saying it, but. Oh, I do. And yeah. It still applies. Okay. So, oh. so <laughs> would you mind just sort of elaborating on your feelings around that statement? And well, I, um, <clears throat> I feel like that. I think the way you put it actually is maybe better or is that the same anyway. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll compare it to like um, cities in Texas. Mm -hmm. Like Dallas is in Texas, but I've always felt like Dallas wanted to be someplace else. Like it wanted to be Boston or Philadelphia or even New York City. And when I went to other places, places in texas like houston or austin or san antonio they seem to embrace their texasness much more so i feel like i'm a little bit dallas and a little bit those other cities too you yeah. know uh, it's it's something that at, at for a while especially when i moved to california after i got out of college i lived mm -hmm. there for a year in la and it really uh it really bugged me and 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 references to the fact of how i talk yeah and carry myself uh it really aggravated me yeah and uh in retrospect i wish i hadn't allowed that to happen i wish i could have embraced it more and say yeah this is me you know right so what yeah and as as i've matured uh however much i have uh, I feel like I've uh, sort of come to that point where it's like, you know, get over it. I don't care yeah. but if you make fun of how I talk, go ahead. Yeah, That's just yeah. me. And there's nothing I can really do about it. Yeah. And so in my, my work, I've sort of embraced that as well. And uh, that's, I grew up, let me just say that I grew up around, uh, on a, on a farm, we had course horses and cows wasn't exactly a ranch, but we had all of that stuff. And, and I didn't, I didn't like any of it. I didn't like farming and I didn't like riding horses. My peers, my, my little friends were, when I was a kid, were very jealous of me because I had all these horses I could theoretically ride at any time, mm -hmm. but I've never trusted horses. We don't, we don't get along. <laughs> and, uh, so I was, I was in that milieu, but didn't, uh, didn't feel like I belonged there, yeah. but I, what did sort of uh, connect with me was the, was the landscape and the environment because it was just wide open space, big blue sky. And after I, after like 35 years of, of uh, being a, an illustrator, you know, I started thinking about what sort of subject matter on my, with my own work that wasn't related to illustration, what, 
what kind of uh, subject matter mm -hmm. would it be logical for me to pursue? And so that just that just seemed right. Yeah, that's sort of the oeuvre, to use a pretentious word, of the, the landscape and what inhabits was was what seemed to be the most interesting, the most closest to my heart. That's what I decided that would be my subject matter. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. it does make sense, and I think that like what you said about deciding to embrace that, like that that is an actual choice that I think a lot of us who who grew up in Texas and other probably areas in the South um, as well, like that, that do have that feeling of like, I'm part of this, it's formative for me, but in some ways that I don't really fit in. And I, um, you know, there's other aspects that, that I may not uh, like, we do find ourselves faced with that choice and sure. a lot, a lot of people leave. And then a lot of people who stay find other ways to distance themselves from it. Um, it's a very complicated relationship sometimes, I think, that we have with the place that we are from. Um, the like, I want to share a story real quick, just like what you said about people kind of making fun of the way that you talk. Um, when I grew up, we were lucky in that we were able to travel a lot and like did we did the whole like family road trip thing like with the pop-up camper mostly going to national parks and that sort of thing that's what my parents were into and so we stayed at a lot of campgrounds and at that time KOA was like the big campground that was ev everywhere and available and it was family friendly like there was usually a, a pool and a playground and other kids, you know? Um, so that's where we, like, I have a, a lot of memories of just like the KOA campgrounds and interacting with other kids from around the country. Um, and I mean, I would say that it was a very consistent experience that we would be, me, we being me and my siblings in the pool or on the playground, like, having so much fun playing with these other kids that we just met and where everyone's getting along perfectly. And then all of a sudden the word y'all would come out of my mouth. And I had so many experiences where people would just go like, ew, you're from Texas and actually <laughs> refuse to play with me after that. Yeah. You know, like we were totally ostracized just because we said the word y'all and my, like, I do have an accent and Texas has many regions and many accents. Um, mine is a little, I don't always know what to call it. Like it's, it's a little more acidified, even though I did grow up in the country. And so I have been able to like travel and be in other places of the world and the country without people necessarily always knowing that I'm from Texas or the South until that word comes out of my mouth. And um, so I've had like that particular word for me, like has had a real, uh, again, like a complicated relationship with that word. And so all of a sudden in the past decade or so, like, I'm not exactly sure when it started, when like all, like all of a sudden that word is everybody's using it and now <laughs> it's even like got this very positive messaging around it like y'all means all you know that right <laughs> is cool and also <laughs> a part of me that's just like like doing this like I remember when y'all exercised me on the playground and now you're using that word you know um so I don't know I just felt the need to share that after you you <laughs> You mentioned that because it definitely like it was a trigger point for me. So, um, well, that's funny because I started using the term uh, "you guys" instead of "y'all." Yeah, which yeah. which worked elsewhere, but when you know my my hometown friends would say, well, "Are you calling guys?" No, it's not you guys. It's y'all. Right. But and now y'all y'all is much more inclusive than you guys. Yeah. Anyway, so you know, I'm glad about that. I yeah. Think that's yeah. I think so too. Um, 
Well, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, I didn't expect to tell that story. That's funny. Um, <laughs> that's a good story. And also I'm just sort of like, it, it, it brought to the surface quite a few emotions that I wasn't expecting to feel. So, um, we'll just, I'll just let those process and sit in that for a minute. I feel particularly drawn to your work in the past and now like for example that landscape that's behind you is just beautiful it's just like uh there's a whole nother aspect to it of um of the land and having respect for the land and the integrity mm -hmm. of it that we're losing in this world and uh and again like ranching farming has a complicated relationship with that um both all of that sounds very corporate now. it is yeah it's like um you know the stewardship aspect of it has just gradually like lessened and lessened and lessened and then like that's been sort of exponential and i feel like there are people out there who are trying to reestablish that part of it. Well, I think that may be happening more on a, an individual basis, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people with their own gardens and that sort of thing, just zero escaping. But I think in, even in cities, if, if zero escaping got more popular, I think that would be a, a good thing. That's not growing food, but I, it would be, it would it'd be yeah. a vast improvement. I think. I mean, my daughter and I were just watching this YouTube video about Singapore last night. And I mean, basically they had just like this exponential population growth on an island. And so they were forced to, um, to find solutions for that. And the government owns the land there. So you don't have the, you know, the tension between public and private land ownership um, that makes it much more complicated here but they created like these amazing green uh buildings you know like the whole city is is like a living city and the, the whole city is the whole island you know but it's just like it's a city and it's also a jungle at the same time and um it's not perfect you know like and again it's probably not replicable everywhere but I find it hopeful, like what you just said about if cities would do things like this. I find mm -hmm. it hopeful that that there's an example out there of something that has had a lot of success in integrating like urbanism and um, balance with nature, you know? Um, I think there's something in American culture that prevents that from taking hold, I'm afraid. I'm yeah, afraid. it's really... Um, it, it, it's so, uh, there's so many layers to it in terms of land rights, who does the land belong to? And you can add the other layer of that, of not just like private public ownership, but colonialism and just like, it's a giant, giant knot, <laughs> you know, that's got to be untangled somehow for us to like find that balance and but I like what you said about people individually are making choices and there's more power in that than I think we really realize and give credit to and I think that like I've had in a lot of these talks like we talk about landscapes and what does that mean for each of the different artists who work with landscapes and it it's all very different depending on who I talk to but I do feel like that the sort of resurgence of landscape as a subject matter in art mm -hmm. is like reflective of a world that recognizes that like we do need to have that connection and we do need to have a sense of stewardship around it you know mm -hmm. whether or not that's like 
in the artist's mind, like part of their intention or like what they're working it with. It's just sort of like in the zeitgeist, you know? Sure. Um, what do you think, like, uh, when you're, what, when you're working with landscapes also read that you said you don't feel like current issues they're not part of it for you in the making process right but I suspect that like most people there's stuff baked in that maybe while you're doing it that's not like your intention to communicate but it's still part of like what draws you to certain things sure and <clears throat> while I don't have any particular um well i guess i do i i don't think i have a particular connection to um, the rural certainly not the rural culture mm -hmm. but I, I i think i i've done some city cityscapes and because that's all that's been a part of me. the main thing is I, I want to depict what's part of my experience mm -hmm. and and the landscape for all my life practically has been uh, a main part of my experience and living in city i've lived in uh you know three three really big cities and that's part of my experience too but oddly maybe it's not odd every studio i've had or every place i've lived there's always been a a, a, a a space between me and whatever else is out there. There's a lot of space. I mean, usually there's, if I'm in a city and I'm in my, in my space, there's not a house immediately across from me. Mm -hmm. uh, where I lived in Dallas, there was a green belt. Another place I lived in Dallas was, had a huge uh, front yard. And then there was a, another huge front yard and an apartment building, yeah. but there was still this space so I've always had, uh, felt that sense and, and wanted and needed that sense of space. Yeah. And I think that comes from uh, some sort of connection to the, the landscape and the environment. I guess there's a subtext since if that's what I mostly depict, uh, there's a subtext of, of not wanting to be in a city. Mm -hmm. and, and there may be a, a, a political uh, uh, subtext to that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, uh, I'm not asking that to at all imply that that's a necessary no, thing at all. Um, I'm just trying to like, kind of get, get, get in there and see like what, <laughs> what's, what's making you tick when you're making your art. Um, I think maybe it's a symbol, maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's sort of an iconic symbol for, uh, uh, space and, and, uh, I started to use the word freedom, but that's got such a, uh, you know, all these words, the loaded word them, these days, patriot, yeah. you know, yeah. all of this stuff has got such toxic stuff connected to it. Now it's hard to use, but, uh, just not, um, not being contained, I guess, is what uh, maybe maybe is part of it as well. I don't really know because I very rarely sit down and think about these things. Yeah. I just do them. Right. You know, that's what makes uh, artist statements. So I guess they're hard for everybody, but yeah. they're, it's, it's just really difficult to verbally explain what it is that you're that you're doing or why you're doing it. I just, it just comes out and I don't, I don't know that I have any control over it really. Yeah. 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 I think that is very true for a lot of people who are making visual art, you know, that like, it's just, it's like different, like learning styles, you know, some, some mm -hmm. people are verbal, some people are visual and kinesthetic and like all of that. And I know that like, you know, that's a little, there's some iffiness around that whole philosophy as well too. But um, I mean, I, I personally feel like I'm both visual and verbal, you know, like I'm, I write mm -hmm. as well. I like talking. That's why I'm doing this. You know? <laughs> um, but also the visual stuff stands on its own and is its own thing and defies the limitation of of words because like you said words are um 
hard to find these days and probably not just these days, probably forever, like that, um, that don't come with like all kinds of associations with them uh, that are going to be different. Like you're going to have different meanings for like some the word freedom is going to mean something very different depending on who you're talking to. And open spaces are going to have like just the idea and the feeling of being in an open space is going to be different depending on who you're talking to. I mean, I definitely have some friends who are from New York or from other cities that are a lot more dense and um, have visited my home turf, you know, which is just north of San Antonio, kind of like entryway into the hill country it's open, but it's also like rolling hills and oaks and, and forest. And they totally freaked out, you know, like they didn't <laughs> like it. <laughs> and I was just like, it's so pretty and calming, you know, everything is relative depending on who's looking at it and what their life experience and perspective is. And that's like the beauty. That's the beauty of it. You know, mm -hmm. you brought up illustration and said that you have a lot of opinions on that. And I know that you worked in that world and, and I, I worked in that world kind of in another way in, in publishing where I was, I was a designer and art director, like working with illustrators. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have some feelings on all of that as well. Uh, let's like, let's shift gears and talk about illustration and your experience and your feelings on that well i i have a very definite definition of definite definition uh -huh. <laughs> i like <literally>. that <laughs> <laughs> of, of what illustration is as uh -huh. opposed to gallery art or fine art or whatever sort of uh, uh name one, one wants to give that but it, to me, illustration has always been uh, it always functions as a as a complement or uh, some associated with another form of communication, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, literature or, or uh, reporting or music or whatever it might be, it functions in concert with, with that. Yeah. And probably on its own wouldn't exist without that as an illustration and a particular illustration could stand on its own and, and many of them do, but, but that's not, that's not the creation point. That's not why it was made. Mm -hmm. And that's not an evaluation. That doesn't make mean it's anything less than any other form of art, but it's just different. Yeah. And uh, you know, sometimes there's a, uh, a sort of a, a put down of, of illustration or a looking down on it. And I, you know, I, I see no, I see no reason to do that because it's not the same thing. Yeah. To me. Yeah. And as, as you know, I mean, you would uh, assign something uh, to an illustrator and they would work based on what you assign them as opposed to just doing it on their own, yeah. with their own volition. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in the context uh, that I was working in, I'm sorry, there's a fly in here that's like <laughs> keeps going right past my face. Um, I don't see him either. In the context of of how I was working, um, it was in educational publishing, which has, you know, some very um, specific constraints for mm -hmm. purpose, because you're, uh, you know, you, you've got to uh, keep in mind your audience and like, um, you know, for example, like you're trying to teach a kid how to read like the illustration has to work in, like you said, work in concert with the instructional material there um, that's appropriate for that specific reading level and age group and whatever, you know? So there, there was like, there was a lot of um, constraint in that and also uh, budget issues to where, you know, there were always illustrators that I was like, that's the person I want to work with, but we couldn't afford them, you know? And so we would work a lot of times with um, illustration houses that were based in India and, hmm. um, and they would mimic people's styles often, which was not 
completely on board with. Yeah. It happens. And, um, but with the, uh, like there's illustrators and, and opportunities for illustrators where uh, you can, as, as the client, you know, you can say like, here's what this is about. Here's what we were aiming for and give them a lot of leeway. And they're going to come back with something that's going to work, but maybe you might not have anticipated exactly what that's going to look like. And then there's um, situations where it's very, very, very directed, like, mm -hmm. you know, like as an art director or designer, you know, I would get out the Sharpie and actually create the layout. Like, this is what your illustration is going to look like. Now you render this in your style and you've mm -hmm. got to leave this little space for the text and like, you know, whatever. Um, so it was much, much more heavily art directed um, and designed by the like in-house publishing staff. Um, so even within illustration, like there's a big spectrum. Sure. There's also stuff like you're talking about illustration being something that works in concert with um, another form of communication, like text, like writing. Um, it's like, if you look at a graphic novel or something like that, that's like this other weird category where, right. you know, it's like those two things are working in tandem, but they're, but they're still under the creative control of the, the author or the, the cartoonist or graphic artist or like, what do, what do we call people who do graphic novels these days? I don't know. Like Art Spiegelman, you know, that did Mouse. I don't know mm -hmm. if you that kind of stuff, but um you know, he's kind of kind of a pioneer in that world. Sure. Um and there's places like where the art, the visuals take over and become prominent and the writing becomes sort of su like supportive of the visual aspect. And then it kind of might go the other way where the visuals like support the written format. So your definite definition definitely <laughs> was like illustration is something that is supportive of another purpose. Whereas art yeah. is something that, uh, oh my God, I just got myself, I painted myself into the corner where I have to define art, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is like an impossible task. Um, there's an openness to it, right? Like right. it's very hard to say what well, is art as opposed it's to more, I think it's more self-expression, mm -hmm. not to interrupt, but I think it's, it's more, uh, and illustration is not, is less that it can be that sometimes, but it's wow. less that. Yeah. It's less involved. You're wow. talking about graphic novels. I think those come closer to art. Yeah. If we're going to do if art with a capital A, if we're going to, uh, uh, separate that from illustration than than they do illustration because they're more wow. self-expression right <clears throat> they may be made for commercial purposes but they're they're more more self-expression involved than uh, necessarily following another uh, another line uh, yeah, yeah. being yeah. at the service of something else right right uh, illustration book illustration uh, uh, magazine magazine and book illustration comics uh even cartoons on tv that was the first art that yeah. i was ever aware of because art in a broader sense wasn't really part of our uh, experience yeah. uh we didn't live near museums uh you know art was not something my parents thought about mm -hmm. or you know uh they got magazines and books and things but uh, they didn't really they didn't think about, I don't think they thought about that aspect of it. And where did that come from? Did yeah. somebody actually do this? So when I became aware of it and started realizing that somebody did do this, well, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, so that, that was a, a kind of a weird thing because uh, my mother was very self, was very indulgent 
and and let me get away with anything. Mm -hmm. My father had a lot of questions about the direction I was going uh -huh. because it just didn't make sense to him. Uh, art art wasn't something that you know a man did. A man worked worked with his you know got his hands dirty. Right. And uh, but I knew that somebody had to make these things, and so I went about going went about finding out how that happens and and that was sort of what set me on the direction of of doing it as a profession yeah and i bet you like literally got your hands dirty quite a lot while creating those paintings <laughs> yeah my uh, yeah I'm about you, pretty but messy I'm always painter, like, yeah. oh it's on my face and like <laughs> everywhere else pretty messy about that stuff myself yeah. so dirty in a different way yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I had a similar um, sense when I was a kid. Like I I was very, very drawn to the illustrations in whatever books that I was looking at. Or, um, I mean, I was like really huge into Dr. Seuss when I was a little kid. And um, one of the one of my favorite ones was I don't know if you know his work that well like but there was one called Ooblek, which is just like this oozy slime stuff starts just like come raining from the sky and it gets stuck in everything and the whole book is in black and white except for the Ooblek slime stuff which is green and they're just very simple line drawings but I would I would study those drawings when I was a kid and just like the the line weight like the variation in his strokes you know that's not just like this uniform consistent line it was like you could see where he was lifting and the amount of pressure he was putting on the with the brush or whatever material he was using I can't quite picture it but um uh, you know, that's definitely not something that most kids were probably tuning into, but that was. Well, well, I think you have to be wired. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. you have to be wired that way. You right. know, I mean, some, some kids are into sports or something, you know, because right. of the physical things, but I was always into like looking at stuff and, yeah. and, and drawing and that, yeah. that's just the way I interacted with the world. Yeah. Not everybody does that, but. No. So as far as like illustration goes, that's something that in my work, I feel like I kind of intentionally play with that line. It is informed by my past in publishing and not just like illustrating a story, but il illustrating like a science concept. Like I, I worked on a lot of um, science books, like textbooks, like high school textbooks and whatnot and um and that sounds really really boring except that I loved it <laughs> and um and part of that was because I would get to be in meetings and on the phone with like an actual physicist from Harvard or wherever sure. and like they're the subject matter expert and I have to like listen to what they're saying in the room with an editor who was formerly a teacher figuring out how to translate that into instruction. And my job is to translate that into visuals that are going to communicate it. And there's been, you know, as the world changes and we live in a more technological world, we also live in a more visual world and more design focused world. And so textbooks look very different these days. Mm -hmm. Looked like, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, they're much more visual and um, designed and illustrative. And um, and I love all that stuff. Like I love all the sciences as much as I like love like just being in nature. And so there's elements that feel like they could be a, like a, a, di a scientific diagram or an illustration of a concept. And I know, and there's very, very specific rules about what you can and can't do in, in science di diagrams, especially. Right. And I know those rules and I really enjoy having the freedom to completely <laughs> break them. So there's, there's like this element of like, it looks like it could be an illustration, but it's not. And I know right. you want 
you have a whole like series that's like your narrative series that it's like you you said like this could be about something but it also could be about nothing or something like that um yeah <laughs> yeah yeah those are really fun it's like a, a lot of weird little um flying machines well, even um, those are connected to uh to the natural world you know and i had a lot of fun with the flying machine but they're sort of mechanized nature there's the kind of a weird steampunk element to them right. without yeah. being steampunk yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like more i was gonna say playful but i'm not sure if that's the right word because i do feel like steampunk is actually very playful um but just more bright and colorful and and with the natural elements those to me feel like you're very much just checking in with like your five-year-old self or something <laughs> and like how yeah definitely. how that version of you saw the world absolutely uh i i think i i like that uh uh interpretation of it but I th that's exactly what's what's going on i think yeah uh, i always i was always um i had a, a sort of a joke in fact i illustrated it one time the concept of uh that that i was uh dropped off by aliens on my parents doorstep because i was had just different you know i wasn't i'm not saying i was special but i had really different interests than, mm -hmm. than everyone around me and I was very into science fiction and uh, fantasy I read a lot of books uh, yeah. and you know and, and comics and that sort of thing on those subjects and so it, it is kind of a throwback to that rather than uh, my interpretation of reality which is what most of my paintings are those are, do kind of uh, look back and so sort yeah. of let me explore that some I feel like that's something that the world needs more of <laughs> people connecting with and i know not everyone ha came from situations where like their experience as a fire <laughs> has been very um traumatic you know like people come from different uh, sure. situations and so it's not always to say that a five-year-old is is going to be in a joyful happy place unfortunately um but there is that element of like the inner child that is pure, that when removed from those scenarios, like um, I think that the world could benefit <laughs> from people uh, nurturing that part of themselves a little more. Sure. Just like joy and fun and imagination. I wish that that's where more people came from. But like you said, a lot of people have different experiences. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that um, art with a capital A should, uh, an artist should reflect, their work should reflect what what they are experiencing or, or mm -hmm. and if it's dark, then then dark it will be. Right. But, but mine hasn't been particularly dark, so yeah. I'm lucky. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what, that's what comes out. Yeah. It brings a smile to your face and there's something that's a gift to the world that I think is undervalued. Just like the simple act of bringing a smile to someone's face for even just a moment, you know, sure. so you can think of it as a service. A good friend of mine, uh, uh, has been on me for years about well you need to do stuff that's edgier or that's or that's more uh, has more of a political content you know and there was a show uh that we both attended and it, and it was very it was very much like that and he says you know you need to do more stuff like this mm -hmm. and i said well you know i gotta be me like sammy davis jr says right. and I, that's just not me and so i can if i tried to do that it would look false so yeah and that whole um you know the it's better to not look false it's better to not look false and it's the the shoulds of course are something, 
avoided in general, in my opinion, especially when they come from an external source, even yeah. if that friend is very, you know, well-intentioned and cares about you. It's like, um, you know who you are and what your heart is and, and what the process of making art is for you. And the fact that, um, you do it in your way allows other people to do it in their way, you know, it's, sure. um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. well, that's, that's, uh, reflects who that person is. Yeah. Even if um, it's scary. I, I just feel like, I mean, there, there's been actually a lot of conversation around this too. And some of the, in the other talks that I've done of that whole feeling that's out there about artists should be focusing on um, current events and be edgier and, uh, you know, whatever it is, but that's only, that's only one aspect of experiencing the world and it's only one little slice of a very large pie of the human experience and also i have very strong feelings about this actually like i just you know there are horrible horrible things going on in the world like right now as we are speaking and yeah. um, that's not new like there's been stuff um all along but it does feel very very big right now because i think we're just more globally all uh connected and we see it it has more effect um just because of the interconnectedness of everything um and there it, it's there can be this feeling of like um you know, if, if this is going on over here, uh, how can we possibly be focusing on something that like brings a smile to your face or is joyful or, or happy? Um, but if we're only allowed to be in this, like, how do we create a world that has more of this? It's like, I don't know if I said that in a way that makes sense or not. It's sure. just like, like, I would very much like to create a world, um, help create a world where people, like we we move away from all of that into this, where everybody gets to just be doing this, you know? And um, yeah. And I, like, you could call me, like, delusional or, like, that's a the pipe. Or, yeah, You're you not the only one. Like, that's right. <laughs> There we go. I Somebody said that sometimes. All of a sudden in very good company <laughs> with that that viewpoint of life. Yeah, I just, um, I think it's real easy to devalue things like a landscape or a little cute flying machine that looks like a bumblebee, you know, <laughs> or like what whatever, whatever it is, you know. Um, and, and absolutely, like, I feel like that's, people have felt that way about, you know, the work that I've done too. Like, you know, I've had a few of just like a landscapes, um, you know, <laughs> there's those people who don't value landscapes and that's okay. But I, like you feel like it's about self-expression and it's, it's also, about self-exploration and it's about uh just being in the way that you experience the world and you know for me it's not always about like I feel like I'm very process focused and mm -hmm. so it's not always about like the finished painting or something it's about what the process of painting brings up in me. Um, and Audi, if thought, whoever the audience, if there is an audience, because I'm just like at this point, there's not always an audience for me, <laughs> or it's very small. Um, 
but like that's almost secondary you know it's like yeah. like who are you creating for i guess is what i'm getting at are you creating for people out there or are you creating for yourself i think that <clears throat> when when people are uh, at least people who know what they're talking about are are saying <clears throat> you you know you should you should do this other thing or you should explore this other subject i think they're trying to i think they, they mean well and they're trying to make make us me better in their evaluation but i i think i can do that within my own context i don't think i necessarily have to go outside of uh what i really uh, care about right to do that to do those to challenge myself right uh, i can do that on my own yeah without necessarily getting into heavier subjects yeah and the the subtext is going to be there no yeah. matter what if that's where the person's head is like the way we started this conversation where i'm talking about like the loss of our natural landscapes and whatnot like there there's a political and environmental right element in that conversation because i brought it i brought it there and that because that's where my head is a lot of times and so for for me like doing a landscape a pure landscape of just a picture of a mountain in whatever style is political and it's also personal you know there's there's many facets to it and so as far as like what people should do shouldn't do as artists honestly i feel like that could just be put in the garbage you know <laughs> <laughs> sounds good like feedback is great and i like i mean i'm like open to <clears throat> people's perspectives of it but for for me what's always interesting is how what people take from it is so completely different than what that's going on for going, me, you going, know? Going, yeah and going back to uh you know talking about it mm -hmm. Uh, to me, it's a lot more interesting for somebody to tell me what they think of it or mm -hmm. what they think of it evaluation wise, but what, what it, what, how they're interpreting it. Yeah. What, uh, what meaning, if any, it, has, it, it brings to them. Yeah. That's, that's more important. That's more interesting to me than whatever gobbledygook I might have to come up saying about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I will also add a caveat that like, sometimes I don't care like what people think, you know, it's just sure. like, it, like you got, <laughs> that's what you got from it. Great. Like I don't connect with that, but if it, if it did that for you, okay. But we, I don't, we're not, I don't know yeah. you really. And I'm not, it's not that I'm going <laughs> to know you, but like, we're not connecting right now. So, but, but that person saw something in the work that meant something to them. And that's, that's cool. Like that's what, it yeah, that's better than, you know, meh. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hate, hating it is better than not having a reaction at all. Yeah. Um, I don't know. People are, people are so funny about, art honestly it's just um like you know what you said about your dad like having the feeling of like a man's work is like you gotta get your hands dirty and I know that was just kind of like the surface level of it but like you and I understand what that means it's like you've right. got to be like producing something constructive and useful and helpful and art is not you know useful in this world so thinks most people but i think differently um but also you know like aaron baker said in in my talk with him you know we're not doing surgery like we're not like <laughs> helping people stay alive when they have a heart attack and so it, it, you know there's like different different aspects of what is useful and helpful and well how, how bland and black and white it would be 
without people expressing themselves in some form or another, you know? Wow. Uh, no, I don't, uh, I haven't saved anybody's life lately, but, right. but you know, but you know I made what? them a little bit happier. That's good too. Yeah. And there's like, I will say that, especially during the like peak pandemic, when we were all locked away in our homes, our art, I feel like in various, in the various forms that art takes, you know, film, television, music, yeah. visual arts, whatever, I feel like it did save people's lives, honestly. And That's I think insane, it, it was a lifeline for me personally to, yeah. um, to be able to like, look at what other people, what other artists were creating and doing and, um, and it, and just like, again, that like this, the very simple act of like bringing a smile to someone's face or reflecting, uh, an experience like a traumatic experience that somebody else might identify with in whatever personal way they've dealt with something similar, like, you know, just lets people know they're not so alone. And there's a lot of value in that. Uh, this is probably uh, of no consequence to anybody but me, but I, I'm um, <clears throat> not an illustrator anymore and don't consider myself one. That's the mm -hmm. only thing I would, to get back to that for a second. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not of that. I did it for 35 years, but I'm just not that anymore. And I, I uh, Someone said, oh, well, you know, you're still an illustrator. And I said, no, I'm not an illustrator. A painter for whatever that's worth. And, and another person got kind of uh, um, offended by that, and, you know, saying there's nothing wrong with illustration. I wasn't saying there's anything wrong with illustration, but I'm not anymore any more than I'm a farm boy anymore. I was, but I'm not now. Uh, and I don't know. I just always uh, want to have that clarity. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it matters to anything. Yeah, I think the way that we define ourselves and especially like in our creative pursuits that are very personal for those of us who are creating it and like feeling like it's a reflection of our ourself and self-expression, I think those distinctions matter, you know, and, and understanding that, again, the lines are blurry. Illustration, there's a spectrum in there and there's a spectrum within art and then i don't know people are going to draw the lines differently some sometimes my work is is said to be the work i do now is said to be illustrative mm -hmm. uh which is okay i mean that's where i developed the way i work and so that's that stands to reason uh, but i was having a conversation with somebody at a gallery uh, we were talking about a painting and different parts of it uh, like windows. Yeah. One, a couple of the windows were, you know, very loosely uh, rendered, just like a couple of strokes. Mm -hmm. And oddly, another window was very carefully uh, noodled over. And the, the person I was talking to says, well, that part of it's very illustrative. And uh, so we got into a discussion about what that meant. Because right. illustration, especially now, other than its function, is is usually not that easily uh, uh, separated from what quote, fine art looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, you know, I thought that was kind of a not particularly productive way of, of describing it because, you know, something's not painted with a broom doesn't necessarily mean that it's, quote, illustrative. I think that's a, you know, um, like that person was responding to the the style. Right, you know, right. Um, rather than the function which is like a whole other part of it. it. To me, that seems very constraining of mm -hmm. what art is and is allowed to be, to say right. that it can't be this because the style reminds a person of illustration, which um, can be very loose. And I mean, not like, again, as someone who's worked with a, like a lot of, a lot of different styles of illustration and different illustrators. It's like, 
there's some of it that's very abstract and very just like watercolor washes, you know, that's just mm -hmm. um, almost um, like hard, hard to see what the picture is until you kind of look at it and then it comes out, you know, it's like there, there's a, like to me, style has nothing to do with illustration or, um, yeah. or like, it's just style. It's just like the, the way that a person creates their thing, you know? So that, I don't know, that to me feels like a very odd observation. I thought it was too. It made for an interesting discussion. But uh, again, it's like, I don't know. I feel like, and I just feel like this in life in general too. It's not always like art, but just in interacting with other human beings, like, um, you know, when, when I or another person feels that like trigger around something, whether it's the word y'all or like how a, a window is rendered or whatever like that's about the person experiencing that it's right. not about the thing that made you experience that i mean exactly. you know, definitely i would say the exception to that is like interactions that are abusive or like violent sure. I mean, like, whatever you know like uh, hopefully people know that <laughs> what I'm talking about like it's um and again that's like the 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 beautiful thing I think that art offers to people is that like that window to or that you know the mirror of like what this is your response like what is that saying about you and I like have no idea how to uh, even approach like what uh what that means to that person having that response, but um, I'll just put that there since this is going <laughs> on YouTube and people will watch it as something I've learned that maybe that will be useful for other people, you know, whether it's in their responses to art or anything else, it's like yeah. triggers are, um, and tr you know, we use that word trigger when it's a, like a intense, emotion you know that's unpleasant a lot of times but it a trigger is like it can trigger a thought or a happy feeling or like what it you know it's just like the button that gets pushed that you know it's like the stimuli let's use that word like cause and effect yeah cause here's an effect whatever the effect is the effect is about you you know and not the stimuli cause. has a different connotation than trigger. Yeah, exactly. A better one. <laughs> um, and that's like uh, I don't know. That's an invitation. I I view it as an invitation. You know, to like. Well, it certainly it in that particular case, it certainly uh, caused caused some discussion and interaction. Yeah. And hopefully, we both learned yeah. something from it. So let me ask you, I was just going back through your Instagram posts and looking at stuff mm -hmm. and you told the story of when you were a child and you watched the moon landing with your family. Yeah. And I was born just like a few years after that. So I missed it. Um, but I do feel like that, I mean, I've always really been interested in like the space program and space exploration and as an extension of my interest in like um, the earth and like planetary science, like recognizing that the earth is part of this big system of it's like, we're not just like this isolated little thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's been, it's a big interest area of interest for me. Um, and I'm really very jealous that you, <laughs> you not only got to see that, but you have a memory of it. Like you were old enough to have a memory of it. And so would you mind sharing that story? <clears throat> well, um, 
sure uh we uh we watched it on television live as it happened we finally uh i think a couple of years before had bought a color television mm -hmm. which was pretty large and so it was great uh just in my our neighbor came over and so it was just a big sort of campfire gathering watching the moon landing with a, an actual campfire no no, no, okay. no, no. I mean, it just that we were. In, I mean, we were in, sort of in a circle. Just making sure. I was like, wait a minute. Did y'all pull the TV out onto the, on the porch, or like, what was going on? <laughs> no, no. It was. Uh, we were on the, the shag carpet <coughs> watching the uh, <laughs> uh, watching the moon landing, but. I was always really interested in that stuff too. I guess maybe another again because you know, first of all, we could see stars really well out there. Uh -huh. And um, it was something else that was outside of my everyday existence, mm -hmm. which I was really interested in escaping. Not that there was anything wrong with it or it was bad or anything. It was just, you know, like I said before, it was just, I didn't fit there. And uh, actually I got a telescope when, um, when I was 13. And uh, the, one of the first times I used it, I came upon Saturn just accidentally. I saw just this bright, you know, light and uh, focused on it and it had rings. Mm -hmm. And so I was real excited, you know, ran inside. Oh, I saw Saturn and said, what? Saw, you saw what? And why is what? And why does that matter? <laughs> sort of the reaction I got from my dad. My mom's like, oh, great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, the, you know, the moon landing was a pretty profound thing. And uh, I, I don't remember exactly what I said on the Instagram post, but um. I hope that was what I repeated was something close to that. Yeah. I mean, you just talked about that. It was a very meaningful experience yeah. for you. And um, do you remember any of like, I mean, and I know it was like through the veil of being a child. And so you're, what you're focusing on is different than if you were an adult, but do you remember like how the adults were? about it like what the mood was or they weren't <clears throat> really demonstrative people but i think they uh thought it was pretty well they thought it was pretty amazing yeah. i don't know where my dad was he was off someplace else but my uh my my mother was just you know i don't know these they were so taciturn people yeah. she was very like oh wow they did that that's amazing yeah. you know not like uh excited about it right. necessarily like me, I'd be like, uh, we just landed on the moon. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of uh, demonstrative stuff right. around my house like that. Um, in fact, if you got too excited about something, you had to be kind of tapped down a little bit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was a Baptist thing, but, uh, you know, they, they believed it, which is one thing, because, you know, there were a lot of people around who didn't believe it ever happened. They, you know, you know I, I, I think it was appreciated as an achievement mm -hmm. and a pretty amazing achievement. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know it was a went over the uh, moon about it, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it was a like, you know, many people in the world were watching like that was mm -hmm. a huge, huge thing. And um, but the fact that they they took the time, you know, to gather, like to turn the TV on and gather the family and you all watched it together. I, oh, that, well, that's meaningful. It's indicative of the fact that it was a notable um, experience, you know, I, I insisted on that. Yeah. You insisted yeah. on that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, well, this is not something we're going to miss. Okay. Well, that's cool. Like even as a child that you were insistent on something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's pretty strong willed, I think. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Um, are, do you feel, do you still like, um, you know, like this, the, like the total solar eclipse, which I think you were, you were already in Taos at that point, right? Yeah. So you weren't in the path of, totality and then like the aurora that crazy aurora you know mm -hmm. um that i i still i'm i like now am watching solar weather channels on youtube and like checking the solar flare activity like every day because i'm just like i didn't see it but i'm like, 
<laughs> I'm going to see before this solar cycle totally peaks out in 2025, <laughs> it's going to happen again because I want to see it. Um, I'm a little obsessed. Do you like, do you still get excited about space events or, Absolutely. you know, whatever? You I uh, follow several of those things on Instagram. You know, uh, I, I keep track of uh, the little, the little uh, traveler on Mars, you know, and the little helicopter that recently started stopped working, unfortunately, but it, it, it didn't do anything, I guess, but it was just cool that, that, uh, that one of our, I say our, humanities <laughs> um, objects is able to fly on another planet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not crash into it, you know, not take off from it, but actually go there and then fly around. That's just amazing. Yeah. And all the vistas that you, that, that Mars, uh, yeah, and you know, I, I, from from the '80s when we started getting really close to the outer planets, mm -hmm. Jupiter and Saturn, they were just beautiful. I was stunned at how beautiful they were, yeah. because uh, you know, through a telescope or or the the, the visuals that were available before that uh, were amazing, but just the, didn't have the the color and the right. and just the the, the abstract. Uh, Jupiter's clouds are just, you know, ridiculous. And, uh, and contrast to like Saturn's, which are more like sort of layers of color, like a, a Rothko or something. Right. You know, Jupiter's more like a Pollock, I guess. Right. Everything is just <laughs> blown all over the place. But yeah, that, I, yeah, I love all that stuff. I still certainly keep up with it. Yeah. It's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing. And, um, like the last couple of talks that I've done with uh, Roel and then Andrea and I actually talked about it. So um, it, it, like, I have felt like, um, you know, in my life growing up in rural Texas, like you are probably a lot of my interests were not shared by my community. And right. I did not share the interests of my community. You know, like I could care less about football. Like I just, <laughs> it's boring to me, you know, like, sorry. Like, I don't know. There's like two minute segments every now and then that are very exciting. <laughs> and um, when I've been in the room and gotten into the excitement, even though I have no idea what's happening, but you know, it's like, uh, it's just never been my thing. Yeah. And so it's fine. Like, I get it. Like, we all have different interests. But uh, it's always exciting for me to, like, have people who have shared interests and and also I have this sense that there's, like, a growing interest in that stuff, you know, that it's not necessarily, like, um, just us nerds who are <laughs> into space exploration and, you know, and right. stuff like that. It's all of a sudden the imagery that's coming from these newer telescopes and the, the rovers and whatnot, they're so dramatic, you know, like they're stunning, visually stunning. And, um, and that gets people's attention i went out to my brothers for the total solar eclipse even though like the san antonio was right on the edge of totality and the part where um where i am is like it was in it but we only had like just slightly over a minute of totality and also light pollution from the city um but where my brother is they had like a full four minutes and 11 seconds, wow. I think it was. And also cool. he's on a farm. And so there's all the animals and I wanted, I wanted to not just have as much of that time. I also wanted to see how like the animals behaved and they were, so, they were super cool. Uh, <laughs> like it was really worth being there for it. That's something I'm, I'm really sorry I missed. Yeah. Because, uh, we only had partial here. I, I, <clears throat> absolutely 
if I had the money to like travel around the world as much as I'd love to, um, be one of those people who just like follow so like total eclipses around the globe and just puts myself in the path like forever because it's mm -hmm. it was really uh like I mean I would call I would dare to say it was a spiritual experience you know it was like it was a it's like a felt thing it's not just like oh that's really cool it got dark and then it got light like it was just um like the the demonstration of again that interconnectedness of like our planet and everything like the system that we're in and then again like oh God, the animals were just <laughs> like amazing and, and what were they funny, doing funny um well one of the coolest things was that my brother keeps bees and i had like gotten up early that morning and and fed all the animals for him because he was just exhausted and so i went then i went on a walk and went, walked back to where the bees were and I, I caught them as they were coming out of their hives and they're just like pouring out you know at daybreak mm -hmm. and um and then I didn't go back there and I wish that I had, but he walked back right as uh, totality was starting. And it was just like the opposite. It was just like, he took some video of it. Uh, they were just like rushing to get like crazy to get back in their hives because like all of a sudden it's getting dark and they're just like, <laughs> what happened? That was a short day, you know? <laughs> and then all the other, like the dogs kind of quieted down and were like, you know, getting ready to go to bed and, <laughs> and the, the chickens all went back to their coop and like started getting quiet. <laughs> but the funniest one to me was that the, the, he has a mule, like a full size mule. <laughs> the mule who's usually very reserved and not like it, he does. They do a lot of rescuing animals. And so I don't really know what conditions that mule was living in before, but it's not a, it's not social you know yeah. like it doesn't um like i've made friends with all the other animals out there because i i do a lot of like farm sitting for them but um that mule wants nothing to do with me or mostly anybody else and it's real quiet like you don't you would almost not even know it's there and so <laughs> it's you know it, like it happened so fast where it's just like light light dark light you know and when and when the light came back, the mule just like full on was just like braying as loud as possible, just like what the fuck, you know? Like it was just, <laughs> it was a little. I feel like it was a little traumatized, and it, I slightly feel bad for like <laughs> laughing about it, <laughs> but but also it was kind of hilarious the way it was behaving. It was just like what the hell just happened, you know? Um, but then just like the people, like, um, like we, as soon as it got dark, like everybody just got rowdy and like, you know, huh. like yelling, like, oh, my God. and then you can hear pockets of people like over the tree canopy, like also, you know, exclaiming and just like, like exuberant, you know, like. And I just, it, it just felt like there's been so much that we've all like, as like communally shared, that's been hard, mm -hmm. you know, whether mm -hmm. it's like the pandemic or uh, just like all of the racial stuff that happened in like 2020, 21 and like shootings and war. I mean, just like whatever there's, it's been, there's been a lot. And we've all been experiencing that together. Um, that like when there was something that everybody all of a sudden was just like joyous about together. Like that, that made quite an impression on me. Like it felt sure. like it's been a really long time since we all had something that we just could share the joy about you know, and excitement. Um, so that was part of it, like that was part of it. And then again, also kind of the awareness that 
um, those groups of people that I was hearing, maybe I wouldn't have necessarily fit in with those people in other contexts or situations, but that was something that we shared. It was just like this basic human response to this thing that was, it felt magical, even though it's very not magical, you know? That was kind of Yeah, weird. like I said, I'm sorry that I missed that <laughs> particular thing. I'm sorry but... you missed it too. And um, definitely, I mean, I think it's like, I don't know, I did know the year and now I've totally forgotten. It's like, we have a ways to go before we have another one of those in in the, the U.S., but if you have that opportunity, if anyone watching ever has that opportunity, I highly recommend getting yourself to a a place where you can observe it and experience it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I didn't get to see the Aurora, you know, even though it was visible even farther south than where I was, I just was in my house in san antonio with the insane light pollution of that city you know well, it was i we didn't see it either yeah and it supposedly was visible here but i didn't see it and yeah i went out at the times you were supposed to go and so you know. what i learned is that like um even like photographs that you see of like that people take of the aurora um under normal conditions like you know in norway or wherever the hell mm -hmm. they are um a lot of that light that's being captured by the photo isn't actually visible to the human eye so the photographs are going to be a lot more spectacular so you if you just even point your phone at it and you know google like what settings to use on your phone or whatever but um like you'll you'll be able to see more through your phone than with the naked eye. And so I think yeah. a, lot, a lot of that <clears throat> was probably going on too. Um, Cause I asked like people who were posting on Facebook pictures of it. I was asking like, compared to what you just posted, like, what did you see with your, with your eye versus in the photograph? And, um, and it kind of was a mixed bag. Like some people were saying that, um they it was very very faint like they almost couldn't see it with the naked eye and then mm -hmm. depending on where they were like some of my friends farther north they they were like no it was just the sky was purple you know um well so. i did i i went outside with the phone and and um supposedly I, you were supposed to look to the north which i did and there was a purple-ish mm -hmm. hue but no you know curtains of yeah light like in the wow. like in the north pole but uh so maybe maybe that was it i don't know i also bumped up bumped it up a bit so yeah. i could see a little more color yeah apparently speaking of, we were talking about the planets and their color apparently a lot of that's false color right yeah but it sure is beautiful anyway yeah it is absolutely yeah, I've done actually done a couple of little Pluto paintings, like when they first came out with some of that imagery from Pluto that showed the heart. I got very into that image and painted a couple small paintings of that. And that's definitely like false color images. That's just like the color. Again, it's like science diagram stuff. It's like the color represents a certain mineral or something that's in the soil. Right that particular geographic location but um otherwise it just looks gray you know uh <laughs> so yeah i like the romance of the uh, enhanced colored myself yeah i mean all like all all of it i'm on board for all of it and just also knowing that they're like the the range of color that human beings can see with our eyes anyways is very, very mm -hmm. limited. And that's why we have infrared, you know, telescopes and all this other stuff. And some of it allows us to look through dust clouds. And um, so it's like, we're seeing something that's there. That's a representation of the color so that our eyes can visually see it. But 
um, it's not exactly the way it is. Like, right. but I think that's how color works anyways, right? It's like color is a very um, weird thing that's just, it's really just like some sort of process in your brain that's like translating information from cones in your eye, you know? There was that, um, <clears throat> there was that internet thing of the dress, I think it was, and you're supposed yeah. to guess, say what color it was. <laughs> it was pretty obvious to me what color it was, but apparently other people saw something else. What color was it for you? Um, well, wasn't there a, like a, a green, it's kind of greenish as I recall. I thought it was either white or blue, but maybe I'm remembering it wrong. Um, in that case, I may have seen blue because there, I didn't, and, uh, there was also, definitely a color there. Yeah. I don't need, I don't actually remember what color I saw first, but I do remember having heated discussions about it. <laughs> um, not necessarily arguments because I, I feel like I gave that up a long time ago. <laughs> like once I understood that color is completely a weird subjective thing. Um, yeah. But my daughter sees very color very differently than I do. And so we have that conversation a lot. Like I did, um, I did some watercolors of Mars landscapes based on like NASA photos. And she was pretty little when I was working on those. And I remember her coming into the studio and just like, she was like, why did you paint that part green? And I was like, like, I just had to look at it for a while. And I did, it was like, if I can remember the color mix that I used, but I was mixing with something else to get this other color. And she was seeing more of the green and I was mm -hmm. seeing more of this other color. So I don't know. It just fascinates me that even like within like close DNA connection between like mother and daughter, like we can totally see things differently, you know? Um, which like, we'll just, because we're a pro like, uh, we, I think we probably have gone over an hour at this point, but, um, like, let's just make that a nice full circle back to where we started about how everybody views everything differently, you know, mm -hmm. and that all these things are going to have a different, like meaning and impact depending on who's looking at it. Uh, Absolutely. Is there anything? And that's probably good. Yeah, Probably. exactly. Like the world would be very boring, like you said, otherwise. <laughs> so um, what I feel is next for humanity is just coming to a place of recognition that that's normal and that's okay, that we can all have different experiences and all have different perspectives. And we don't have to even like the way somebody else is seeing or doing something but as long as it's not interfering with our ability to to live with freedom you know like um <laughs> a-okay -A in my <laughs> like you don't have to like it if it's not messing with your stuff then who you know let it go uh, i think that's a noble ambition yeah I'll just put it up there with my pie in the sky thing about joy <laughs> and happiness that humanity's like, I'm trying to create that world. Well, let's work on it. Yeah. This was fun. It was a pleasure. I hope that you are enjoying New Mexico. It's we a are. beautiful place. We Absolutely. didn't even talk about that, but maybe someday we will.